Let's talk about insulation types. You're gonna say, Joe, you're showing us this house. Why would we ever do 70 volt in a house? Because stereo doesn't matter and it's gonna be easier to install. Let's all say that together. We're all 8 ohm guys. Stereo doesn't matter and it's a 70 volt install, okay? If I'm in my bathroom, I don't care if I have left and right separation, okay? It does not matter to me. I just wanna have some music, my den, my bedroom, whatever it is, I'm just looking for music. So whole home distributed audio. Again, don't use 70 volt for a home theater, okay? Keep selling better speakers. But so this is what this would look like. So you've got your, uh, your Atmos Onkyo receiver available from Skywalker AV right here. And you're going to go zone two out to my Atlas Sound power amplifier. And then you are going to take one speaker wire and you are going to run it to a bathroom, a bedroom, the den, maybe the basement, and then a couple of bedrooms. You're going to put a volume control in each one of those. So whenever this thing is on and you walk into a room, you can turn it up and it's going to be there for you. So you can listen to whatever you want and you can turn it down if it's too loud or you can turn it off if you don't want it anymore. Okay, now this is a 70 volt speaker that looks kind of like this third one right here. If you guys can see that, it's probably stupid that I'm shining that at the back. That one right there. Uh, it's very low profile. It's a four inch tuned in ported enclosure. So it will actually fit, uh, if you've got a second floor, it'll fit between the first and the second. Uh, just like a regular speaker, it does have the backhand. So even though in a residence, UL rules don't normally apply, uh, you can tell your customer that this does have a backhand, so it's not going to catch your insulation on fire if something happens, uh, and you're not going to burn your house down, but you're going to get great sound because it's designed to get great sound. Uh, each of these attenuators can be up to 100 watts. You don't need that with this particular setup. You could use this as 10 watts. You can use it as 35 watts. You know, each one of these could be tapped at two or, th two or four watts and you would have plenty of sound for that one room. And I know that's now the second time I've talked about a very low number of watts and we're all used to dealing with 60, 75, 80, 100, 150 <coughs> watt RMS speakers. Most of your amplifiers are not doing 125 watts all the time, right? It's a, it's a, it's a root mean squared. It happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen all the time. So it's sort of a misleading number in the consumer world, but consumers are driven by what they hear and what they think they know, and so a bigger number is better, which in some cases is true. I've had people tell me that a dual voice coil speaker is twice as loud as a single voice coil speaker. Also not true, but their, their reality is, is, is our world. With a 70 volt system, Four ohms, eight ohms, six, oh, I'm sorry, four watts, 16 watts, eight watts, whatever it is, is going to be plenty loud enough for a single room. And you'll see when we get to some of these other commercial examples, tapping a speaker at eight or 16 watts amidst a bunch of other speakers is going to be enough power for a restaurant, for a, an office, for whatever. But so this is an application that a lot of guys don't think about. So say that you're gonna do this now. You know, you're gonna run, maybe your zone out, zone two out's gonna go to another amp and a speaker selector, or you're gonna have to put in a, uh, you know, some sort of control piece uh, where there's gonna be wall plates in each room, it could get really expensive, maybe customer doesn't wanna invest in that. You can do eight ohm volume controls, but then again, you've now gotta worry about impedance, you've gotta do series parallel, you've gotta make it work in whatever you're doing. 70 volt gives you the ability to do it, run one speaker wire, very simple, very easy, positive to negative. Make sure you do not exceed 80% of the total output of that amplifier. Your customer will be super happy. You don't even have to tell them it's 70 volt. It won't even make a difference to them. All they care is that there's a nice speaker in the ceiling and that they get music when they go in there, okay? You know, the technology behind it, customers don't necessarily care about. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do. Uh, it's up to us to A, find the best solution um, and the most economical for, for us. So, you know, this may save some money on hardware. It doesn't mean it should save money on labor, even though it's going to. You know, your labor rate is what it is. Just because it's gonna take you less time doesn't mean you should charge less. You know, this is an opportunity to increase your sale and increase your profitability uh, by doing something just a little bit different uh, than what you've done in the past. You know, if, you, if you're gonna do a system like this and you knew it was gonna take you eight man hours doing it eight ohm, well, it might take you two or three doing a 70 volt. So there's no reason to not charge the eight hours. You know, you're still doing home-home distributed audio. 
you're just now taking you know five hours of that straight to the bank. What about backyards? Anybody ever do a backyard? How we do backyards? What's the, give me an average backyard install. Backyard install will be uh, we run wire from inside the house and kind of went out to the patio or you know wherever it's going to be, um, and then connect it to like a sonal sample or to the second zone of uh, whatever. And then you're just running a, a speaker to a speaker wire to each speaker. All right, so in my backyard, I also want to do distributed audio. And this is a super fancy backyard, by the way. I found this on uh, SketchUp models. I wish my house looked like this. But so same situation that we had inside. Here's our home theater amp, zone two out to a power amplifier, just like Mike described. Um, whether it's outside or it's close enough outside that I can just get the speaker wire right through the wall. Uh, now I'm going to four volume control. So imagine this is by my pool. You know, this is in my garden area, I've got this on my patio and these on my backyard. Now I have a volume control in each of those areas, so if I'm, if I'm at the pool and I want to turn the pool up, I can turn the pool all the way up, but if I'm not in the pool, because it's winter time, the pool speakers don't need to be running, I can turn it down. But this is still one wire going to each of the volume controls and then a wire from each of the volume controls out to the speakers. And it's just one wire from the volume control, there's no impedance matching, there's no series parallel, there's none of that. It's just run one to the next, to the next, to the next, and then move on to your next zone so that you can do that, okay? Do you guys see an application for something like this? Does this make sense to you? Yes, no? If you turn one of them down and you know you're never gonna use like the pool, and it, it doesn't matter, right? Nope, no matter at all. The control will use up the, why did you just turn down? The, 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 the volume control is still going to see the power coming to it because it's directly connected to the amplifier, but it, it's just not going to do anything. You know, if you've got it all the way down, it just won't do anything. What is the amp? Does it see that thing? That the amp will see the load that's on it, but the amp won't do anything. So remember, as long as you're within 80% of the total power of the amp, you have no problems. Right? So each of these could be at 10, each of these could be a 10, each of these could be a 10, or 4, or 5, whatever it's going to be. And uh, as long as you stay within, you know, this is a 100 watt amplifier. As long as your total doesn't add up to more than 80, you got no problems. And I give you that 80% rule. That's a rule. I'm sorry. It's a guideline, not a rule. Okay, you could theoretically do 100 watts on a 100 watt amp. But customers are un, un, you know, unreliable on what they're going to do to the gain on that thing. And uh, with the 80% rule, you give yourself some headroom in case somebody gets past your security covers and, and turns that volume up, which never happens. Customers never touch equipment, ever. Okay, uh, so backyard, real simple, real easy. Four zones, one amplifier, uh, four volume controls. Cover the whole thing. All right, so let's talk about some commercial applications. This is where you guys have the biggest chance to make an impact into your business because chances are you drive by these kind of places all the time. You know, I took, uh, this is I think Terra Lane out here, Terra Lane. I drove Terra Lane all the way down to TW something? DR Hughes, right. DR Hughes Drive. So I took this side road and there's a ton of businesses on that side road. A ton of them, like all kinds of businesses selling all kinds of stuff. And I bet if we went in there, none of them have audio. I'm willing to bet. The people in there are bored. You know, they probably have one of those like Beats pills behind the behind the counter. So just the guy working there hears it, or they've got you know the little who knows. They've got some stupid little speaker that makes you think of like a 1970s gas station, right? Where that could be a whole lot better for them. And I bet you guys shop in places like this all the time, which is something that we'll talk about: is how to how to how to get business, how to how to get into this market. Um, but so office environments. As I said earlier, Arizona is the, like the home of strip malls. I don't know if we invented them or we just love them or what the deal is, but they're, I can't throw a rock in any direction without hitting a strip mall. And the guy that builds the strip mall, the, the GC that builds the strip mall, he doesn't care about audio. He could care less, really. He may put it in the parking lot because that's one of the customer's requirements that's doing the development, but they don't put it in the buildings because the landlord, whoever's building it, is gonna rent those out to whoever's gonna do it and whatever they do inside is gonna be up to them. So there are a ton of opportunities in strip malls for small retail locations, restaurants, chiropractor offices, dentist offices, tattoo shops. I mean, there's an unlimited amount of things, of opportunities that are out there. It's just a matter of looking for them. 
you know, currently you guys are dealing with a lot of uh, residential customers. Those residential customers probably have jobs, otherwise they're not going to pay you. They may even own their own businesses. So they may have a need for something like this right away that that's another way for you to get another job very easily. But so an office environment, let's call this Joe's Malpractice Doctor's Office. And I want to do paging, I want to do speech privacy, which we're going to talk about for a lot uh, in a little bit. And then I want to also do paging because I've got a waiting room where I got people there. Here's my system. Okay, I've got a mixer amplifier that I'm running an, uh, a paging mic into. Maybe I've got my, this could be an iPod, this could be a satellite radio, and then this is a, maybe my computer or a DVD player or something else uh, going into my amplifier. You'll notice here that I've got my office area. I've got these speakers. Uh, I've got four speakers tapped at four watts for a total of 24 watts. I've got two in my lobby, the same thing. Uh, giving me 24 watts of coverage. I'm under the 30 for this with a total of 24 watts. Again, my 80% rule. Um, but six speakers, an amplifier, and a mic. And one line of speaker wire going to each of these. Okay, Pretty simple, pretty easy. You want to make this even more simple. Say that they don't want to do paging. All they want to do is they just want to have background music. You know, you could do an amp like this, which I'll pass around in a while when we talk about it, 20 watts, even the 10 watt version. And you can do four speakers like this. You know, you cut your ceiling tile, drop this right in, wire it up, you're done. You know, no, no cutting holes, no mounting anything, just cut the ceiling tile, put it in. You know, I bet you guys can buy that for, you know, 500 bucks. Sell it, install for 2,000, 1,500, whatever you got to do to, you know, get your overheads and make some profit. And it's four speakers and an amp. They're going to hook up their iPod in their main office and they just want to play throughout the building. That's super easy. You know, not a lot of thought involved. This is a little more complex, but not, not much. You know, we're cutting some holes in this one. But, you know, you guys cut holes all day in ceilings. You know, it's not, that won't be something new. Skywalker has some great hole cutting tools downstairs as well, if you don't have those yet. <laughs> All right, so how about a restaurant and a bar? I assume everybody here eats, probably drinks also. We're in, we're in the install world, so prerequisite. Uh, so again, I want to do background music, paging in the waiting area like we talked about earlier, and then maybe some audio support for video displays. You know, so maybe we're, we're showing direct TV football games on Sundays or something like that, or blues games on the weekdays. By the way, that's a terrible name for a hockey team, especially when they're bad. The blues are giving me the blues. Like, it just depresses me. I'm sorry. Don't get me wrong, we have a terrible hockey team, so I have nothing to say about it. The Coyotes are terrible. But the blues is a bad name. I get why they're named that. It's just unfortunate. All right, so now I've got a 100-watt mixer amplifier here, okay? And now I've got all kinds of stuff happening. I've got my mic for push-to-talk paging. Maybe I've got telco paging. You know, maybe I've got a PBX, and uh, if the phone rings and uh, someone demands to speak to the manager because they got E. coli or something like that, the hostess can then, you know, dial the paging tone. And, hey, Joe, pick up, the, pick up the call on extension one or whatever. Uh, a couple of music source and then my TV audio. Uh, again, uh, one speaker wire. I've got eight speakers. No, I have more than that. Oh, these ones are tapped lower. So I've got, well, I don't know what I did here. <laughs> I have no idea what I did here. Anyway, so I've got dining area, bar area, and then restaurants, or restrooms. So ignore my number there, and we'll just make up some new numbers. So it doesn't need to be loud in the bathrooms, right? Bathrooms is just for ambiance, so that you don't hear everything that's going on in the bathroom, OK? Uh, so that speaker does not need to, be need to be tapped as loud as a busy dining room. So remember, when we're talking about 70 volt speakers, as long as you're under the 80% rule, you can tap the speakers at whatever you want. So the ones out here could be tapped at eight, these could be tapped at four, and these could be tapped at two. And it's not going to affect the system, it's just gonna affect the loudness of those speakers. So you don't need to have all of them tapped at eight or 16 in order for the system to work. You can have multiple taps on the transformers as long as the total wattage, again, does not exceed 80% of what this can handle. So my math here is really bad, sorry. I don't know what I was doing there. But uh, the idea is still the same. As long as all of that wattage does not uh, have more than the amplifier, uh, you're good to go. And this is a typical restaurant. I mean, this could be, oh, Charlie's, Chili's, 
McGurk's. By the way, if anyone ever goes to McGurk's, they've got those JBL speakers on the wall. Let's try and get them a new system. It doesn't sound very good. All right, we need some professionals in there to do it. If anybody in here did that install, I apologize. All right. <laughs> so, uh, cool thing about this amp, which I'll show you guys in a while too, is this little plate. So that actually gives you remote input selection, uh, remotely, remote input selection volume control. So if this rack is our equipment rack and it's locked in the manager's office, and again, he works nine to five, Monday through Friday, but it's busier at night and needs to be louder, you can set this wall plate up to 200 feet away using a standard CAT uh, five connection. So it's seven wires into the amp, eight wires into the wall plate. And you can then give them the selectability to switch between inputs two, three, and four, as well as control that volume uh, remotely. So uh, it also has labels on it that you can add. Uh, on this particular amp, zone four is a 3.5 that uh, controls the volume itself, so a, a device. You could give someone the ability to plug a, an iPod or something in behind the bar or somewhere else, and then that could become their zone uh, controller or their, their source. All right, retail. This is my grocery store. I have a lot of, uh, of checkouts there. If anyone does a Walmart, I want to know about it. Uh, but business music, support for up to four paging stations, and then high ceilings. So, you know, in a place like this, your ceiling might be 20 feet. Putting a standard speaker in there may not be loud enough. You need something that's going to project more volume. Um, remember, every time we double our distance, we're losing 6 dB. So in a 12-foot ceiling, we're losing almost 12 dB right up. Or on a 20-foot ceiling, we're losing almost 12 dB right away. So something like a compression horn um, or a speaker like this that can hang from the ceiling that we can drop lower um, would be uh, an important option to have there so that we can cover the area that we're trying to cover and still meet the customer's expectations. So here, now we've got a 400 watt amplifier. Still same sources, we've added in a couple of mics now instead of just one. Um, I've got high ceiling speakers, which are gonna be my compression drivers. Again, the restroom's tapped at a lower wattage. You see these are at four, those are at 16. And then I've got four speakers in my warehouse, uh, you know, in case I'm the backup bagging guy and they need help up front and they make a page, I gotta be able to hear it. Or if uh, you know we're getting a delivery and I'm out on the floor and I need to come back there, um, so we've got multiple different types of speakers in the system, tapped at different wattages, doing different things, okay? So another uh, really easy option because there's a lot of buildings like this one, in fact, that this kind of setup would be perfect in. You know, maybe we're gonna have background music downstairs for uh, when customers come into shop and then we're gonna do paging in the warehouse. Up here we're gonna have some sound reinforcement for that same paging or whatever, maybe some background music so that these poor folks when I'm here talking don't have to listen to me. Um, but again, super easy. One speaker wire coming out, run it out to your speakers in one big line, and then call it done. All right, is high school football big here? This is like a, this is like a, this is almost like college in Arizona. I have no idea where, when that happened, but there's like people that, there's websites and there's talking and there's this, and I'm, I have no kids, so I don't know anything about it. But apparently it's a big deal. But this is a big deal because, especially for you guys and for, for home integrators, because most people that work at a school are not familiar, familiar with procurement, okay? Like they don't know how to go about getting an audio system. Who do we call? What do we do? I have no idea where to go. So they'll Google audio, you know, audio installers, and you guys are gonna come up more than commercial guys, okay? Or maybe you've done installs in some of the homes and you know, the PTA is talking about upgrading the football field system. Well, who do we know that does audio? Well, you know, Mike does audio, let's call him. Or maybe you're on the PTA and you can say, well, I can do audio, you know, I'll get you a quote. Um, it's a really easy way to get into a job that is not hard to accomplish and that um, can be a good way to spread your name because chances are they're gonna let you advertise your business now once you've done the system so more and more people are gonna see it. And it also gives you something else. I should ask this in the beginning. Does everybody have a website? Website, website. Okay, all right. It's 2015, guys. We got to get a website. I'm not telling. It doesn't have to be awesome. Okay, it's just got to have your name, your business, where you're located, how to contact you, what you can do, and probably some pictures of installations you've done. That's all it's got to be. Three pages max. GoDaddy, you can do it pretty cheap. If you don't have one, you should get one because that's the number one way people are searching for your business. 
I don't even, they give a phone book to me like every year, throw it on my, my porch and literally it goes straight into the recycling bin because I have no use for it. The internet, Google, website. If there's two things we learned today, it's my 80% rule. I know we all should have a website. And if you need help with your website, let me know and I can help you out, all right? I can set you in the right direction. Okay, so people are gonna search the internet for this athletic field. So either you need to get on the PTA, make friends with the PTA, or get a website. Those are my three recommendations here. So at this athletic field, we wanna do music and we wanna do public address. What's the number one problem with music through a public address system? Like Edit that out, all right? <laughs> you led me down the wrong path. All right, it does sound bad. It does sound bad. But PA speakers are not designed to play low frequencies. So when they're trying to get the crowd hyped up between quarters and they put on whatever the hot rap or whatever music it is today, I have Justin Bieber comes on, whatever that is, uh, the low frequencies in that music are gonna blow up all of your horns, okay? This is very important because horns on a football field are not easy to install, okay? They, chances are they're maybe on top of the skybox, they're on the light poles, there's somewhere where you can't just go out and fix the problem very easily. So you want to make sure that you've got it set up properly so that you're not coming back to do that. Because if you've got to rent a cherry picker or something to install it, you don't want to rent a cherry picker to come back and put it up and, and to replace it. So in this particular example, I've got a small football field. I've got three stadium horns. You know, in this particular instance, I would have two of them on top of the press box. We make this in a couple of different um, Dispersion configurations, two 90 by 90s on top of the press box would cover most of the home field, one on the other side of the field uh, to cover the away bleachers, and then this is a subwoofer that I would put underneath the stands in order to get that uh, low frequency when they do decide to play music. So you'd have all your sources in the press box or wherever it's going to be, running that into some kind of mixer. That's the, that's the only other thing I don't make is mixers. Uh, out of the mixer, you come into this little box right here, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, you also come to the sub out into this two channel power amp. So one channel goes to the sub. This is a high frequency filter. So what this does being between the mixer is it will sort out anything from 180 hertz and above or below, it will not play. This is going to protect your horns. That is why the addition of this subwoofer is important. Because if you do not have the subwoofer and you're just playing music, it is going to sound bad as we, Mike so eloquently put it but the addition of this subwoofer is going to give them that effect mounted underneath the bleachers. They're also going to feel it. Uh, so it is going to be sort of that total experience that they're going to be happy with. You know, in this example, we're talking about, what is it, six, six pieces and some speaker wire, plus these components that, that I don't make. But pretty easy to install, pretty easy to do. And again, you should never have to come back because somebody blew it up. This is one that you definitely want to take all the knobs off probably silicone them in place, maybe glue a plate on the front because you know high school kids are gonna try and get in there and do everything they can to, to make it better. But if we set it at our max up front, do the security, again, this is really easy um, and it's really low hanging fruit. You know, for the amount of product that's in here, some of the bigger commercial integrators, they don't wanna do it. It's gonna take too much time or it's gonna take them away from other jobs that are bigger. So this is something that on the grassroots level, home integrator can get into super easy and do it relatively easily. Questions about that? Huh? <coughs> okay. This is the number one growth category for you guys in the commercial audio world. Every single install that you do should have some sort of speech privacy involved in it. Has anybody ever heard of speech privacy or sound masking? Okay, one, two, okay, three. So uh, what this is, is this is white or pink noise that is designed to reduce the distraction or the listening ability of someone at a listening position. That really made no sense. I'll make it make more sense. Okay, so what is, what is speech privacy? So we're gonna cover something up. We're gonna mask, we're gonna mask or disguise it. Um, what sound masking is designed to do is if I'm up here having a conversation, obviously without this microphone on, with Randy, if I put a sound masking speaker above you guys, you would see that I'm talking. 
you would even hear some of brr, brr, brr. You, would, you would know that I'm talking, but you wouldn't be able to understand it. The reason that this is important and it's the number one category that you guys can grow in in commercial is that every single installation that you do in some way can use a sound masking system. Every single job that you do commercially probably has an office, whether it's the owners or the managers or whoever. There may be a human resources department, depending on the size of it, where there's a human resources manager. There may be a receptionist where someone is giving them some confidential information. Um, there may be, you know, you may be dealing with a small bank and people are talking about their financial information. And unfortunately, in this day and age, Arizona leads the way in identity theft. Yes. Um, but people don't want their identity stolen. People don't want their business to be known. No matter what we say on Facebook, we don't want other people to know our business, at least not our important business. Okay, so what a sound masking system is designed to do is to keep that business their business. And nobody, again, nobody wants to get sued. So imagine I'm in, at my doctor and he's, you know, giving me the bad news about the disease I contracted when I visited Thailand. And someone, my neighbor is in the hallway and here's what he's telling me. And then now the rumor mill is flying and now everybody knows my business, right? So now I'm really mad because the doctor is supposed to keep my information confidential. I certainly don't want my neighbor knowing. Um, a sound masking system can alleviate that. So we're going to talk uh, pretty in depth uh, about this. You know, in some ways you guys have heard sound masking before, you know, when you're on an airplane, you hear that, uh, you know, you can't necessarily understand all the conversations that are happening around you. You can kind of hear them, but you just know people are talking if they're talking. Sound masking at work. Um, you know, when you're riding a car with the window open, the guy in the back can't hear the two people talking in the front. Um, I like to do that to my friends. Uh, sound masking naturally. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there's a number of other ways. We can actually go downstairs. Skywalker's got some sound masking installed at their, at their counter downstairs uh, so that you guys, when you come in, don't have to hear Mark talking to his girlfriend on the phone. All right, so speech privacy. So this is not speech privacy. Speech privacy is not the cone of silence. Okay, sound masking does not reduce sound, does not eliminate sound, does not put you in a bubble where you can't hear anything. Sound masking actually makes the room louder. Okay, so that's something that we're gonna wrap our heads around. It took me about two years to wrap my head around that. Um, if we're masking sound, why are we making it louder? And the reason is because the sound masking speaker is always gonna be at the listener, not at the talker. Okay, we are trying to raise the ambient noise level at the listener so that they cannot understand what we are talking about. So if someone says, I want you to eliminate noise, you can recommend them this thing. Okay, tell them to look up the isolator. They can buy it online probably. You can't help them. But if they want speech privacy, you can help them. Uh, so using shaped random noise. A uh, sound masking system consists of an amplifier, a sound masking generator, an equalizer, and then speakers. Because depending on the room, depending on what's going on in that room, whether it's you know a call center or it's just talking, there's certain frequencies that you want the sound masking to be higher because it's going to garble that, that frequency more. You know, the average person talks somewhere between, we'll call it 900 to maybe 2K, right? That's sort of the, depending on who you are. Um, so those are really the ranges that we're gonna concentrate most on with the masking because if we can put more noise into that frequency level, at the listener, the less intelligible the speaking is going to be at the talker. Make sense? Okay. So why use it? Open office, employees complain. You know, it's too loud. Mark's on the phone with his girlfriend all the time. I don't want to hear that. This guy's doing this. This guy's doing that. I can't get my work done. Okay. Um, noise problems coupled with uh, speech privacy makes people more comfortable. You know, I don't, I'm not as distracted now. You know, and this is good when you're talking to a business owner because they want their employees to be as productive as possible. And then they also want their employees' information to be as confidential as possible. You know, if you know that, if everyone knows that one person has all these personal problems and every time they go to talk to the manager about them, the whole group crowds outside the door so they can hear what the, what the latest news is, um, you know, they're not getting anything done. So this is a way to keep people from having the ability to get distracted. So speech privacy has been around for a long time. This is not a new technology. This is not something that I just invented or I'm making up. Uh, Atlas Sound's been making products for about 35 years. Uh, white noise and pink noise are the two um, most frequently used technologies. White noise is 
all frequencies all at once. So for those of us that are old enough to remember when TV actually went off the air, and you know, we had the poltergeist, that was white noise. Pink noise uh, doesn't have as much low end because humans don't speak in that low, so it's more of a you know, uh, 600K and above uh, frequency, which is more often used. Uh, now in an installation, depending on where you're putting it, that will affect if you're using white or pink because some materials are gonna absorb some of that sound better than others, so you've gotta overcome building materials, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so what are the advantages? It's the least expensive way to do this. Okay, you could, when you're building a building, fill all the walls with foam, and you could put steel doors on, and you could put sound isolating material on all the outside of the doors, but by the time you do that, it's really expensive. Adding a generator and amp and some speakers is very cheap. Uh, it works at the listener, so you don't have to put yourself into an anechoic chamber in order to not hear anything. Um, you can put the listener and make it louder for them, so that way nothing is as intelligible. Uh, treat the entire space, so it's not just cone of silence at somebody, it's actually doing the larger area. And then you can also add background music and paging if you wanted to, depending on uh, what kind of amp you're running and that sort of thing. All right, the disadvantage is if you don't do it right, it's gonna sound terrible. So doing it right is very important. It's something that we can help you out with in the system design. We have the number one guy in the sound masking industry that works for us uh, on sound masking system design, whether it's you know, a small office or it's a, you know, we've done Google. The Google building in, uh, in Washington State has an Atlas Sound Sound Masking System and it's like, I think 10 floors, almost a million square feet, it's ridiculous. Uh, un unrealistic expectations, the cone of silence, that does not exist. I'm not going to make it quieter, it's impossible to do unless you wear the isolator. So a customer needs to understand upfront that you are not going to take noise away. You are actually going to make it louder. Because if they don't understand that upfront and then they hear this, water running noise, this whoosh noise, they're gonna be like, what, what is this? So they gotta understand what it is up front. Because if they don't wanna live with that, then don't sell it to them, because then they're just gonna be upset. Um, people with hearing loss, if you make it louder and you've got people that can't hear already, that's a problem for them. So talking to your customer up front, do you have anybody that's got you know, a hearing impairment? And there's a lot of reasons for that, not wearing headphones at the gun range. Maybe you used to work in an engine plant, who knows? There's a lot of reasons that people lose their hearing. Maybe they're just getting old. Um, but adding sound masking is gonna make their life more difficult, especially in an emergency. If someone's got an emergency page that comes out or you know, they got a customer waiting for them in the lobby, if they can't hear that, then that's bad for them. And then uh, people with a visual handicap uh, who rely on their hearing uh, to, to tell them what to do. If you make it louder for them, you've also got a problem. So this is important because the Americans with Disabilities Act entitles everyone to have uh, uh, access to the same information uh, in the workplace. So if, if there's this, you know, if people that, that have these uh, impairments are in the building, sound masking may not be the best option. Again, very important to talk to your customer beforehand. <coughs> so we talked about this a little bit. You can use this anywhere, and I highly recommend that you do. This should be an add-on to every sale that you do because nobody wants to get sued. This is a great way to help them from getting sued. I hate to sell on fear, I hate it, but it's the reality of the world that we live in and there's a practical purpose for this and it adds the ability for you guys to increase your sale uh, you know, by a thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks, depending on what kind of system it is. So speech privacy, this is what we're talking about. So if this is my area of distraction, it's 45 feet. I guarantee you I'm distracting all of these people right now, okay? And they're probably mad about it, maybe they're wearing headphones already. Headphones is a great way to do speech privacy because now you can't hear what's going on, but if something important happened, you couldn't hear it, you're at a loss. With, with sound masking, you notice that that 45 feet comes down to 15 feet. So now I only hear stuff that's in my immediate area. Much easier for me to, to do, my, do my work, concentrate on things, or not eavesdrop. You know, if you've got a, a lobby, dentist, chiropractor, doctor, whatever it is, someone comes in and is given their social security number as a new patient, you don't want the nefarious guy waiting in the waiting room to be like, oh, I can hear this lady's social security number. Let me just save this on my phone and I'll steal her identity later. Having sound masking above that listener keeps that from being intelligible. So that way we're protecting uh, confidentiality, which is part of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. HIPAA. You start throwing out words like that, people start listening because you, know, if you sound like you know what you're talking about. So keep that one in your back pocket. And then when you recommend a sound masking system and say the, the term HIPAA, people will start listening. All right, so, uh, man, we kind of already talked about that. All right, 
Talked about this too. What can it do? It can't do these things. Okay? It can bother people though. It may bother people. Some people will hear that whoosh depending on how loud it is and uh, be bothered by it. You know, if you've got people that come in, if one person comes into the office to start the day, they're going to notice the sound masking. It is going to sound like the water is running. I do it every day. I've been there for 10 years. Every day I get in there at 6 and I can hear water running. And every day I'm like, I should call the maintenance guy and tell him the water's running. And I'm like, oh wait, that's the sound masking. You know, don't worry about it. By the time the rest of the employees come in and phones start ringing and conversations are happening, you can't hear it anymore. Um, but I have an office that's right next to a bunch of cubes where people are on the phone all the time. I can't understand anything that they're saying or what they're doing, uh, even with my door open. So it's, uh, it, it's working very effectively. So design rule number one, I've said this many times, the speaker goes at the listener. Can't say that enough. If you put the speaker at the talker, the talker is just going to talk louder and it's going to be easier for the listener to hear because they're going to have to talk above that added noise that's now in the room. We're trying to make it unintelligible to the listener. So the speaker always goes at the listener. So in the, in the example of a restaurant or a bar or a doctor's office where there's going to be a closed door conversation and having with private conversations going, the speaker goes in the hallway outside, not in the room. Very important. Okay. Design rule number two, it really needs to be a background system. People need to not be aware of it because if they're aware of it, they think about it and that just causes more distraction, which totally negates the whole point of doing it in the first place, which, to make, which was to give them less distractions. Uh, hardware should be out of sight, so people shouldn't be able to see it. Most sound masking speakers get mounted in the uh, plenum space above the ceiling tile, or if you have a raised floor, it goes in the floor uh, underneath so that you don't actually see it. Putting a point source speaker in the ceiling, there's a lot of systems that are out there that are doing that now. It's a very bad way to do sound masking because you get direct dispersion over somebody. So that is going to make it very loud at that person as opposed to putting it in the ceiling where you're going to get a lot more reflection and then the sound's going to come through the tile. They don't see it, they don't know about it, they don't hear it. It's sort of out of sight, out of mind. Very important for sound masking. All right, so anyway, fundamental design concepts. If you don't want Atlas to do this for you and you want to do it yourself, there's a couple things to remember. Okay. Speakers under a raised floor create a very uniform sound masking sound. Uh, you know, I don't, I've not been in a lot of buildings that have raised floors. It's not something that really exists in uh, Arizona at all. I think it's more of an older style development, so not necessarily a new style. So I think most of the installations that you'd wind up doing uh, are going to be above a, a drop tile ceiling. Um, speakers in an open ceiling uh, with a height of up 20 feet. Uh, speaker above the ceiling tiles, this is very common. And then uh, down firing speakers like we talked about, not recommended because it's really going to be uh, noticeable and loud and, and you're going to get a lot of complaints from the people that are, that are having to listen to it. Okay, so most speakers are above the ceiling. This is really important to remember um, because you are going to be able to get a lot more distribution above that ceiling tile. People aren't going to see it. They're not going to hear it. It's actually above the ceiling tile and it fires up instead of firing down at the tile. So it's got a, it's a little box, like that little black box there, slightly bigger. It's got some hanging arms. You fire up, sound comes up, and sort of falls down uh, toward the ceiling tiles and then into the room, uh, giving you a very non-obtrusive sound. Uh, mounted above six inches above the ceiling tiles, that's the typical place to do it. You know, most uh, plenum spaces are anywhere from two to four feet. Uh, you would hang the speaker about six inches above the tile, shooting up. Uh, can, you can hide it, you can aim it. Um, pretty easy to get to by removing a ceiling tile, so installation is not very difficult. Uh, in, a, uh, you know, in a commercial setting, most, most, most offices now are drop tile ceilings, so it's pretty easy. You do run into some restaurants where you have a, you know, like an industrial sort of open ceiling application. You just need to mount that speaker higher and out of the way so that people wouldn't see it, but we could help you out with that. So white or pink noise, uh, we talked about the two types. Pink noise is used in this plenum and, uh, or open ceiling, depending on what you're doing. And then uh, white noise, if you've got sheetrock ceilings or if it's in the floor, uh, you would use it there because more of that, more frequencies are going to get absorbed by that material. So you've got to uh, use white noise because it's every frequency, and frequency instead of uh, pink noise. Okay, tuning is very important. You have to use an RTA here. You have to use an RTA here. 
because when we or you do the do the design do the design you have to make sure that it sounds right and that all of the frequencies are right where you're putting the speaker at the listener so using an RTA is a must it's an expensive tool do you guys all does anybody here have an RTA I mean they're expensive but if you're gonna get in the sound masking business it's gonna be your best friend because if you don't set it up right, you're gonna be coming back often because the customer is going to be unhappy with it. But if you can set it right the first time with an RTA, you should never have to come back. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're using uh, an EQ. Uh, you're gonna be looking at octaves and thirds. Uh, that's where you're gonna be, uh, that's why you need that RTA. Uh, your slope is gonna be sort of like that and you've gotta be able to see that uh, on the RTA itself. So this is a, this is just information. It's not something that you really need to take with you. But the open office masking curve, uh, it's smooth and obtrusive. So it should be, you know, if this is the 20 hertz down here, it would look like this and come in and be nice and even. Uh, depending on the height of cubes or other things that are in the office or the area, uh, you've got to adjust your curve in order to overcome those things. Um, but uh, all relatively easy. Uh, you can notice that the final masking level is 48 dB. So it's pretty low. Very unobtrusive, but it's still going to be there and it's going to help mask those uh, conversations. In an open office, uh, it's going to be a little bit higher. Uh, I'm sorry, lower. But uh, in an open office, it's going to be higher than a closed office, which is what this is. Um, because you've got walls now in the way, you've got doors, you've got other things that are already blocking some of that sound, so it doesn't need to be as loud. All right, so Atlas has been doing this for a really long time. Um, 35 years, free design assistance again, and everything you need from the amps to the generators to the speakers and the EQs even. All right, so do you guys have a sound, sound masking question that we didn't talk about yet? All right, so let's talk about finding commercial jobs. Where are you guys currently finding your commercial opportunities? Like when you guys are doing a, you guys do restaurants? Anybody ever done a commercial restaurant? How'd you? How, so how do you get those jobs? Do people come to you? Do you go to them? Do you guys have outbound prospecting? What do you do? All the above. All the above. Okay. Good. It's really good. What about the rest of you guys? Or we haven't jumped in yet. We haven't gotten in the... We've dipped our toe, but we haven't jumped in the pool. So getting 70 volt jobs, you know, we talked about being on the PTA and that was a serious conversation because networking and meeting people is going to be the best way to do that because an easier thing to do than someone Googling how to do something is to ask somebody they know that does it. Okay, so if people know that you're the audio guy and not just the home audio guy, but also the commercial audio guy, you know, and I've met you at soccer, or I've met you at the bar, or I've met you wherever, and I know you're an audio guy and I decide I'm opening my own business and I need some audio, oh, well, I know an audio guy. Let me call him and see, what he's, let me see what he, if he can do this for me. Because he doesn't have to do any work that way. He already knows you, probably already trusts you. You know, there's not a, I gotta invite someone in and make sure they're not ripping me off and all that. You're already somebody that they know. So networking with people that you know is the easiest way to get commercial jobs. And you gotta tell people about it. If you don't have a website, get a website. Can't emphasize that enough. Google is the number one place that people search for information in the world now. And if you're the only audio guy in your town, and somebody searches audio in St. Charles, in O'Fallon, in whatever, you're gonna come up automatically without even having to pay anybody to do it. You know, at least you're gonna get on the first page. So having a website is very key in order to get people to understand that you are in that business, networking at events, handing out business cards. You know, we, we talk about football and, and high school sports. You know, the booster club will give you the opportunity to advertise, whether it's a banner on a fence, whether it's in a program, whether it's in something. It's relatively inexpensive. It is a tax write-off. It is a great tool because parents of those kids go to those games, look at that stuff. They have a lot of needs, whether it's your home audio business or your commercial audio business. You get people that want residential audio. We talked about it earlier. They probably have a business or they probably work somewhere and they may have a need for audio. Right? So when you're doing something in their house, oh, what kind of business are you in? What do you do? Do you have audio there? Did you know that we can do X, Y, and Z? Do you have a sound masking system? Do you have paging? You know, what are you doing? Are you using a stupid you know, Beats pill? Whatever it is, I can make that a lot better for you, help your customer experience a lot better. Talking to the customers you already have is a great way to get commercial jobs. 
online, we talked about at Google, people got to find you, but if you want to go out and find bid projects that you want to bid on, MissouriBids.com. You can go there and find out all the jobs that are out there from uh, anything that's, that's out to bid, whether it's a government thing or it's a private thing. You can go on there and search your area and see what's out there that you might be able to do. Find RFP.com. That is a, uh, you got to pay for that one, unfortunately, but it is a listing of all the requests for um, projects that are out there. So if someone's got something that they want to bid, you can go out there and find out what they're doing, and then you can submit a design for it that way with your you know, costs and all that to win. Partnerships is another great one. You know, the uh, first thing that goes into a building is a network now, right? Besides the 110 electricity. Network is the first thing that goes in. Does everybody here do network also? So, all right. If you're not doing network, meet the network guy. Okay, because he's going in there first. He's already running wire. If he can get you a meeting with the owner who maybe has not even put a bid out for audio yet, and he can get you in there and say, hey, this is my buddy. He does audio. We can do wiring all at the same time if you're going to need an audio system. Well, then that project never goes to bid anyway. You never have to go up against somebody else as long as you come in with a price that the customer is willing to pay. Um, but that gives you the ability to get the job right up front. You know, if you're already a network guy and you're in there running network, ask the guy about audio. What are you planning on doing for audio? Did you know that while we're here running this network cable, I can run speaker wire and install your speakers? You know, we can add it on to what we're doing. We're already here. It's more labor. It's some more parts, but we're on site. And that way it never goes out to somebody else. Um, you know, there's other partnerships that you can make. Phone company guys, cable guys, satellite guys. You know, there's all these kind of people that are out there that are already going in and talking to that person. If you can recommend them and they can recommend you and you guys are seeing customers, it's a great way to get, in, to get into jobs because a lot of customers don't realize what they need, especially audio. They always think about it last. I have no idea why. But they're ready to open their building and they're like, oh, we have no sound. Oh, we'll go get that Beats pill. Okay, that's terrible. That's a bad experience for everyone shopping or eating in that place. So making partnerships with people that are complementary, not competitive to you, uh, is a great way to help both of your businesses. And then be involved. This goes back to the PTA. You know, this goes back into some of the trade organizations that are out there. You know, the National Systems Contractor Association, NSCA.org, uh, is, a, is a great organization that, uh, whose, whole, whose sole objective is to improve the uh, business opportunities for, for system contractors, for integrators, whether it be security alarm or uh, audio. Uh, so being in trade organizations, being involved in local organizations, you know, getting involved online, getting certified uh, with Infocom or Cedia and some of these things that are out there uh, is a real important way to also bolster yourself. You know, if, if we were both mechanics and uh, you were, was it MESA certified and I wasn't, I would, you know, you would hopefully advertise that because I'd probably, as a customer, go see you instead of, you know, Joe the garage hack, I'd go see this guy who's got a training. You know, so if you're a CTS or a CTI certified integrator, um, you know, that's like putting an MD on the end of your title. You know, that gives you, that gives a lot of credibility to you and your business because people know that you are trained. You know, people are afraid, people are afraid of what they don't know and they're afraid to let people in their house and nobody trusts the salesman. So you've got to be able to give them as much confidence as you can, which is very important why you should have a website. It makes you look legitimate. I can't, I can't harp on this enough. I won't go anywhere to eat that doesn't have a website. I'll just go ahead and say it now. I do a fair amount of traveling and I Google restaurants all the time. If it doesn't have a website, it might be the best food in the world. I'm not going there. Okay? If you can't invest in that, that bit of advertising, it's just not going to happen. And unfortunately, that's the way a lot of people think. So no website, get one. Same thing with certifications. Very important. Gives you a lot of credibility in your customer's eyes. Uh, gives you the, uh, the ability to say, this is why I'm better. This is why I'm more expensive. This is why I'm this versus this other guy that you're talking to is because I'm going to do it right. I've got all this stuff going on. Just words of advice from things I have seen around the country. Questions on any of this? Okay, we're almost, we're gonna almost be done. Uh, lunch is at 11? Yes. All right, good, 45 minutes. We only got 45 minutes left, guys. The pain will end soon, I promise. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of products today. I'm just gonna go into some specific Atlas stuff uh, that you'll start seeing at Skywalker soon. Bob's going to give me a, a large PO for a lot of product. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so amplifiers, three different kinds of amplifiers. Mixer amps, power amps, and then what I'm calling my mini amps. 
they're really power amplifiers also, but I put them in their own category because they're, they're, they're very specialized. So a mixer amp, multi-input, single channel, power amp, um, could have multi-channels, uh, generally a single input, uh, whether it's gonna be a balanced or unbalanced, and then uh, the minis uh, are all gonna be power amps. TSDs, so this is, this is actually my favorite product and it's the easiest one in the world to use. So that's a 20 volt, I'm sorry, a 20 watt, 70 volt amp. We make it in a 10 watt also, which is half as deep. We also make it in a two by 25 and a uh, two by 12 four ohm, uh, eight ohm version. So if you, someone needed to add a pair of stereo speakers that didn't need to be super loud, you can use a little box like that to do that. <clears throat> cool thing about that is that a single amp like that, if someone just wants to run their iPod or a satellite radio or something, run into four to eight speakers. I mean, that's a very cheap install, very cheap parts, really easy way to add on. If someone wanted to add a sound masking system, that'd be a great amp to use. Run it into a generator, run it out to the... Uh... Okay, when both of you get up and leave, I get nervous. So, all right, well good, that's all right then. All right, so uh, this is the back of the 20VG which is going around right now. You'll notice again, forum, 25 volt, 75 volt, or 100 volt. And then the uh, stereo version, uh, it's got two channels. You can bridge it if you need to. It's got some, some good application uh, for small zones, things like that. Okay, so now let's talk about some speakers. Have we got a question on amps? I sell a lot more amps than what I talked about here, but I don't want to bore you guys all day with product and that kind of stuff. Okay, so this is a new product that we just released this summer. In fact, it's not even shipping yet. Um, we've been making a speaker like this for a long time called the FAP uh, Series 2. We make it in a four inch, a six inch, an eight inch compression version, standard ceiling speaker, um, tuned in ported enclosure, a high uh, output transformer, so you can get it to up to 60 watts on a couple of them. This one happens to be uh, 16. Um, this new version has one big uh, advantage. Uh, you don't need a drill to install it. Okay, so you'll notice these little gray arms that are on here. So once you cut your hole and you've got your secondary security point, which is very important, a lot of AHJs require this. So make sure you have some steel wire that you can wind around that. So if it does fall out of the ceiling, it gets caught by that. Uh, inside here is a two position Phoenix connector in and out. So uh, you just jay chain one to the next, uh, very easy. So once you get all that done, you get it put into the ceiling, you pull this little arm out, you feel some tension. The uh, spring will move, you just pull it down, lock it into place, and now it's locked in. So your arm is, uh, your arm is where it needs to be, your dog leg. If you ever need to take it out of the ceiling for some reason, you loosen this up. You've got this little tool that comes in the box, this little hole right here, pop it back into place. Lock your leg, it'll fall right out of the ceiling. Okay, so this is a three inch, we make it in a four and a half, we also make it in a six. Uh, you'll notice on the front of this, there's the tap selector. So once you get it wired in the ceiling, if you need to adjust it, make it louder for whatever reason, you don't have to pull it back out of the ceiling. You just need to take the grill off, take a screwdriver, switch the tap to something else, whether it's too hot or it's too, too low. Uh, you can make that adjustment. It does come in the box. You know, a, lot of, a lot of people wonder how we, you know, how you install something like this. In the box, it does come with these three pieces. So this is what's going to sit on your tile bridge. If you've got a drop tile ceiling, which is going to keep it from falling through the ceiling, uh, so you don't have to buy something separate. It is in the box already. Let me uh, pass this guy around. You guys can take a look at it. So we call that uh, the safety first mounting system. I don't know who came up with that. I mean, it wasn't me. But the problem that uh, exists in the world today is that um, most dog legs are sheet metal screws, right? It's just steel. So in a high humidity environment, over time, they're gonna rust. And if they rust, they can break. And if they break, the dog leg can fall, and then the speaker falls. And if someone didn't do a secondary security, then the speaker's gonna fall and hit somebody in the head. Unfortunately, we had a speaker fall out of a ceiling at a train station in Australia. Luckily, the train station was not open. So no one got hurt, but it opened our eyes to this problem. So now you'll notice as this is coming around, uh, it's actually a plastic piece now instead of a steel screw so that it cannot rust out. Uh, so that if you are putting it in a, in a high humidity environment, um, you're not gonna have to worry about it breaking. Three models, we talked about that. 
Oh, this is a cool video. Now it's time for the AV portion of the show. So this just shows how uh, the dog leg works. Cool thing about the dog leg is because it is uh, um, this quick release style, it will actually fit anywhere from double thick sheetrock all the way down to sheet metal. You know, most, uh, most dog legs, you gotta have at least a quarter inch tile in order to install them. This one will go down uh, all the way to sheet metal without a problem. Uh, and then it's got a traditionally, you know, this looks like a home audio grill. It's a higher end uh, looking product instead of the pie plate baffles that you see on super cheap speakers, which we sell a lot of, by the way. And for someone that needs two, four or five watts, it's a really cheap alternative to uh, something like that speaker that we're passing around. Uh, both of these are UL uh, 1480 and 2043 listed, all three of these parts, uh, which is important. In our current series, uh, we have all of them are 1480, but only some of them are 2043. So depending on, uh, again, the, the codes in your town, uh, something to keep in mind when you're specifying a product. Okay, the SM series. This is actually our, probably our number one selling speaker family. This is this four inch speaker that I'm using over here. Let me, uh, let me do a quick demo here, hang on. It's, uh, so, uh, you know, we're talking about wattage and I keep talking about four watts and six watts and this and that. So I think I have this tapped at eight watts. Let me turn this down. So just to give you guys an idea of what eight watts sounds like. So this is eight watts and my iPod is at 80% volume. So for background music, a four inch speaker, you know, if we're all just sitting in here chatting and just need this on background, this is probably gonna be plenty of noise. You know, we don't need to be at 150 watts RMS in order to be able to do it. You know, this will go louder if I go to 100% volume on the iPod, but the iPod always distorts at 100% volume and it makes it sound like crap. So I was limited to 80%. But a uh, bunch of installers, anybody got a flathead screwdriver? Okay, hang on. The what? Uh, they'll be shipping in December, I believe. So if we go to 16 on this. Oh, I'm actually, I'm wrong. This is that four watts. So this is 16 watts. So we don't need 150 watts in order to do what we're trying to do at a restaurant level because we're not looking for a concert sound, we're looking for background music. So as you can see, when we talk about 2, 4, 8, 16 watts, it's constant. It's always that, it's always that power, so it's more than enough to, to give the background music that we're looking for. Uh, the 4 and the 6 version of that that we're passing around have 32 watts. Uh, these we go up to... I think the eight on this one is up to 60. So there's a four and a half, a five and a quarter, I'm sorry, a four, a five and a quarter, and an eight. Uh, all weather, talc impregnated, uh, plastic enclosure, transformers behind a uh, waterproof uh, panel, um, white or black, very easy to install, perfect for restaurants, bars, you know, if you're doing an outdoor shopping center and they wanna have music on the, you know, the promenade outside the stores, it's another great, great part to use. Uh, the pendant mount speaker, often overlooked but making a comeback because a lot of people love the industrial look of an open ceiling now. So this is a, a four inch. Yeah, that's a four inch. Uh, we also make it in three different versions of eight inch. Uh, we make it in a high ceiling eight inch with a compression driver. We make it in an eight inch just like that one that you can play some music through. And then we make it in a, a basically a paging only version uh, or a real low background music version. Say that you're doing a Movie theater is a good version of this. You know, if you've got a movie theater where they want to have some speakers out in the lobby, but they don't want it to be overwhelming, they want it to be hidden in the ceiling, you know, this comes with the wiring 
uh, to wire it. I think it's 30 feet of wire that's in there. Also works with standard um, ceiling mount brackets, the pipe, so that if you're going to do a, if you want to do a hard pipe, so it doesn't float. Sometimes with air conditioning, depending on where it's located next to the vent, they'll swing gently in the breeze, which can also be a problem for burglar alarms. So keep that in mind if you're ever specifying those. Make it out of the, out of the reach of the motion detector uh, if there's air conditioning. Uh, available in black and white. Uh, another great uh, a great solution for those open area restaurants, stuff like that, bars, those kind of things. Okay, the easy one. So this guy is really a paging and background music only speaker, low background music. So if you don't want to mess around with, you know, Atlas sells some in the neighborhood of 700 different speaker combinations, where you can buy a speaker with a bunch of different transformer options, a bunch of different baffle options. I want it white, I want it square, I want it aluminum. We have more parts than I can ever imagine. You know, if you, if you need a back can, which most commercial audio jobs do, a back can, we make round ones, shallow ones, deep ones, black ones, galvanized, it's out of control. But if you don't want to mess around with all of that, and you just need a simple solution, this is a simple solution. So this is an eight inch speaker with a five watt transformer on it. Also comes with a one by two ceiling tile. We also make this in a two by two. And then I also make it in a one foot by six inch with a three inch driver. So if you're gonna do a, a small office or something like that for these speakers, one of those little amps, this is a great way to do it. If you notice the transformer on this one is going to be wires. So you've got constant, common, and then you've got to just select whichever color is the tap that you're looking for, whether it's half a watt, one watt, two watt, and then wire it that way, and then wire them in, daisy chain them together with uh, all the other ones that are in line. This is that cheap pipe plate speaker I was talking about. We probably sell a million of these a year at least. Um, real basic, cut a hole, put it in the ceiling. All it's gonna do is make some noise. Great for paging, not optimum for music. Uh, but if someone just wants something that's real basic, this is a great way to go. Uh, the SD72W includes the speaker and the baffle. UL1480 and UL2043. Uh, tell me more about fire rated. What are you looking for? Are we, I, I make a fireproof enclosure for them. Yeah. There's actually a fireproof skew that's got uh, fiberboard, like a fiberboard box that goes around it. Yeah. Top of my head, I have no idea what that part number is. UHT something, I think. Uh, but these are like, you know, 15 bucks a piece, your cost, something like that. I mean, it's a cheap, cheap, cheap. Cheap. Anyway, arena horns, high school gyms, high school football fields, soccer fields, uh, 12 inch driver, low, uh, high frequency compression driver, um, 90 by 90, 65 by 65, 90 by 40. We also make a dual 12 inch subversion of this. It's very lightweight, it's roto molded, it's all weather, uh, it's easy to install, it's got an all weather gasket on the back, wires through the back. Um, we also make the bigger version, which was in my previous model. This is available in either an 8, 12, or 15. Um, also with the high frequency compression driver. This is a big, heavy speaker. This is the one that you don't want to wire wrong because you don't want to go out there and mess around with it again. But for, you know, if you're going to do a stadium that's going to be there for a while, it's a great speaker to use because it'll SPL for a long distance. It does have wide dispersion model available and it will put out a lot of uh, sound. Paging horns. Man, these things have been around. I don't think we've changed this design in like 70 years. Like this is, I didn't like talking about this, but this is a 30 watt transformer version. We also have a 15 watt transformer version. Uh, those are great for paging applications. Um, when I used to be athletic, I went to 24 hour fitness and you know they had those in the basketball gym so that uh, they could yell at clients that weren't picking up their kids because they only gave an hour of free uh, daycare. So they would page into the gym through a speaker that looks just like that one. Uh, but if you've got outdoor paging where it's not gonna be music and you just need something that's quick and easy, warehouse stuff, shipping departments. I mean, I've seen that thing take a full on kick from a basketball and not, uh, not get damaged. So it's uh, uh, very robust. Uh, it's also available in this like weird off-white. I've never actually seen one of those anywhere. 
but I have seen a lot of the gray ones around. Okay, sound masking. We spent a lot of time talking about sound masking, so now I'm going to make it easy for you. This is an all-in-one sound masking unit. Amplifier, generator, speakers, all in one box. This is what you would put in the hallway above the ceiling. It comes with hangers so that you can suspend it from the ceiling if you need to. It also has a four watt amplifier in it, so if you needed to put more speakers onto that one, uh, you could put more speakers onto that one. <coughs> um, cool thing about that is it's one single unit that you can add onto any sale. And then you can also add on installation for it because you're going to have to install it. Uh, but it does everything that you need it to do. It will either do white or pink noise. Um, we have a handy data sheet that's available online that will tell you where to install that or, or how to adjust it depending on where it's going. You know, one of the jokes that we have at the, at the office is that you can sell that to residential customers with little kids. Put it outside the master bedroom, do some sound masking for whatever's happening, and uh, go from there. All right, so we talked about the half rack. That is what it looks like with the vertical kit installed. So you can route, uh, that's a DSP box, and those are two, uh, two RU six channel amplifiers. Uh, so you can get more product in there uh, as necessary. The half rack, the loader. Okay, this is my favorite thing. There might be enough of you that all of you can buy one today. I think Randy's got them on special. So how many guys in here install stuff in racks? All right, so I've got, this is an older version of this. The new version is much cooler, actually. It's got a flat top on it, so that cords don't get stuck. But what this does is this gives you a second pair of hands. Okay, if you've got a big amp or a UPS or something else that you're trying to install, if you unlock it, you can put it, in, oh man, into your rack. If I can get it off the mic cord here. Into the rack, lock it in place. Now you can put up to 150 pounds on this thing. So now you don't have to hold your amp with one hand and try and drill and four screws. You put that guy in, lock it in, slide your amp in, drink your coffee. Screw it in slowly. I think I actually have a sweet video of this starring a very attractive Italian man. Look at that guy. So uh, that is a six channel amplifier that uh, I should probably work out more like Randy does. What's that? I'm not saying anything important. That I guarantee you. Terrible lighting in this one. But so it's difficult to do this. I mean, doing it by, especially if you're by yourself. And even if you're with somebody else, having two guys around a rack, one guy trying to hold the product and one guy trying to screw it in uh, can be a little bit cumbersome. But so the new, the new one, like I said, has a metal plate on the top. The ones that you guys have, Bob, has a metal plate on the top. So when you slide something in, the cord won't fall down and then you'll be up against it when you push it in, uh, unlike the version that I brought. Uh, but so you'll see that it just supports it right there. Now you can take your screws and through the wonders of video editing, I have the fastest wrist in the world. <sighs> Look at that. It's impressive. A lot, a lot of years of practice going to that. Um, but so then when you're done, you take it out, your equipment is loaded. Uh, the real benefit to this is, I mean, here own their business. Nobody owns the business that you work for. So the, the real benefit to this is not only in saving time, um, because if you don't have two guys out at a job uh, and you only have one, this does save a lot of time, but it also saves a lot of injury. Now, if you guys are like me, I'm not getting any younger, all right? As I just proved when I almost fell over down here. Um, so, you know, my back, hurts every other day, my knees are bad, all this kind of stuff. So if you're bending around and trying to lift heavy stuff and screw it in, you know, you can mess up a lot of your body and then, you, you know, you may have to miss work or something, which makes you not get paid and that could be a problem when bills come due. So this is really something that everybody that works on a rack should have uh, in their truck because it will save you, it, you know, it'll, may, it'll pay for itself tenfold, you know, long term. Um, so that's just another cool thing that we do as well as make a bunch of racks and other stuff.